So speaking of over-the-counter, those of course used to be cleared bilaterally, which meant it's just an agreement between two parties. Uh, there still is some, of course, agreement about credit worthiness. Um, the ICA master agreement uh, that we'll talk about more uh, when we talk about swaps, actually. Um, and this has a credit support annex, a CSA, that does describe collateral, uh, but they aren't settled daily, so while if you default you will lose whatever collateral you posted, um, any further recovery will depend on the court system, most likely, and certainly won't happen anytime soon. So with bilateral clearing, that's exactly what got uh, Lehman's counterparties um, into trouble when Lehman defaulted. Those who had collateral um, through the CSAs that they had with Lehman uh, were able to keep it. Uh, those who didn't or didn't have enough uh, didn't, and those who had no collateral because they had some other arrangement and collateral was pledged to those OTC counterparties, uh, well, they were just out of luck until the bankruptcy process resolved. So due to sort of this realization following the bankruptcy of, of Lehman and the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, uh, there now is a requirement for standardized over-the-counter derivative transactions between financial institutions to be cleared now centrally rather than uh, bilaterally through a clearinghouse that looks really very much like um, an exchange. So this central counterparty, a CCP, uh, functions very much like an exchange clearinghouse. Uh, it also has members who provide initial margin. Um, they have variation margin that they have to pay in depending on how the trades of the people who place trades with them go. Um, if a company is not a member, they can, as with an exchange, clear their trades through a member of a CCP. And what this does is it effectively um, sort of collapses this formerly uh, very complex web of bilateral uh, agreements between any two counterparties of an OTC contract uh, to something that looks very much like an exchange with uh, really every party just being linked to the CCP and then the CCP being linked to every counterparty, uh, but mitigating the um, sort of systemic risk where so many potentially connections between counterparties could be disrupted by the default of, let's say, any one of them. If this financial institution, for example, were to default, that would potentially affect this bilateral agreement, this bilateral agreement, this one, this one, this one, could potentially impact uh, all of the other financial institutions, uh, especially if they were themselves trying to be hedged and were relying on um, the offsetting flows from this counterparty agreement that is now defaulted by this defaulting institution. Whereas if the same institution defaults, but all of their derivatives are cleared through a CCP, well, then hopefully there's enough margin left in the system that while, yes, they will likely be bankrupt and um, there will be negative consequences to that, uh, whoever they had as their counterparties will hopefully not be affected. Um, generally, one difference between futures and forwards is that for futures, uh, daily variation margin doesn't actually earn interest uh, because, remember, futures are settled daily. Uh, for a uh, central clearing counterparty, um, or even a bilaterally cleared contract with a CSA, uh, variation margin will generally earn interest because it's not settled daily. Um, and for futures contracts, variation margin, that sort of extra bit you put in when you have a margin call, uh, has to be in cash, but um, other types of margin can be satisfied by either cash or marketable assets, uh, which are subjected to maybe some haircut, in other words, an adjustment in their value as pledgeable collateral. 
Now, when it comes to quotes uh, for futures, uh, there's, in addition to prices, a few important fields to keep in mind. Uh, there is open interest, the number of contracts outstanding, which is just equal to the number of either long positions or short positions, because remember, for every long position there is a short position, and we don't want to double count. Uh, the settlement price, which is the price that uh, occurs right before the closing of trading for each day, and that's sort of what guides the settlement process, um, and the volume of trading, the number of trades made in a single day. So the way that this would look is, as in other markets, we have the open price, the high price of the day, the low price of the day. Uh, we look at the prior settling price, the last price on the previous day, and its difference between or difference between that and the settled price or the last price of today um, to actually look at that uh, idea of changes in the future price for computation of margin and settlement. And so, for example, if the last trade of today uh, were now at the close of market, this uh, trade of trading price of $60.20, that would become today's settlement if that was what the price was at the end of trading today. We would then look at the difference between the prior settle and the current settle. We would see if the change is negative uh, 55 cents, and that would guide the allocation of margin, in this case out of the long party's uh, margin account and into the short party's margin account. And in the meantime, we would also track what the volume is, how many contracts were actually traded that day. All of this is relative to May 13th, uh, 2015. And we can also see how uh, volume actually re reacts to maturity. So the June 2015 contract that had this change of 55 cents um, in favor of the short party, uh, that one was traded quite frequently, a uh, total of 379, almost 380,000 contracts uh, changed hands. Um, about one-tenth of that was the volume for the September contract, um, a little more for December, a little bit less for December a year from now, and about 1% uh, for December two years from now. So you can see how much volume drops off, and it usually does, uh, for long maturity uh, derivative contracts, which makes it more difficult to hedge with them. Um, and we'll discuss how you can actually then correct for that by using short-term contracts to hedge even long-term obligations. Uh, but this is sort of why looking at volume is important, because it can tell you actually uh, how much liquidity there is for you to potentially make a trade in this particular maturity uh, futures contract. So for the two-year contract, um, it just doesn't seem like there's very much trading activity there. You'd probably face um, really unfavorable bid-ask bid spreads, and if you make a bigger trade, you would be more likely to move the market against you uh, than if you were trading in the short-term uh, one-month contracts. Now, when it comes to delivery, um, if a futures contract is not closed out before maturity, it's settled by delivering the assets that underlie the contract. Um, when they are, uh, if there's sort of some choice about what can be delivered, where and when, uh, it's up to the short party to choose. So of the different options of locations, grades, and times, uh, the short party can choose perhaps the most favorable to them. Uh, a few contracts, uh, specifically stuff that can't actually be delivered physically, uh, such as a stock index or an exchange rate, uh, those are settled in cash. Again, just sort of out of the practicality that um, one can't actually drive up with a wagon load of exchange rate, uh, you have to convert it into currency. And if there uh, is a cash settlement, uh, those contracts are traded until a predetermined time, and then they are all closed out. 
whereas if there is a physical settlement, uh, there's sort of an important set of dates to keep track of. Um, there is what is known as a first notice day, uh, which is the earliest when the short side can announce an intent um, to deliver. And the exchange will assign that intent to one of the long parties on that exchange, usually the one that has held the contract the longest. Um, there's also the last notice day by which every short side should announce their intent to deliver and plans to deliver for the exchange to assign them uh, to the long counterparties. Um, and also there is a last trading day, which is usually a few days before the last notice day. So on a timeline, you can have the delivery month. At some point in the month, there's going to be that first notice day. Sometimes it can be the whole month, so the first notice day would be the first day of the month in which the futures contract matures. There's going to be the last notice day by which all intents to deliver must be uh, delivered to the exchange. And at some point here, a few days before last, is going to be that last trading day. That's sort of the last chance that if somebody doesn't want to take delivery and they are long, for them to close their position. Um, if they still haven't closed it, then they are likely going to get delivered. Now, what sorts of patterns can we observe in futures prices uh, by maturity? Well, if we plot um, maturity on the horizontal axis and the futures price on the vertical, we can see maybe three distinct patterns. One would be perhaps the most common, where if we plot maturity on the horizontal, the future price on the vertical, we will see a rise in future prices as the maturity of those futures contracts rises itself. And this is, in a way, the natural state of things if you think about that equation that relates the futures price to the spot price times 1 plus the interest rate plus also the cost of storage. And perhaps we can add insurance on top of that since that's compounded to the number of years in the future if we're talking about annual costs. Well, that means that as we compound it more, we should expect futures prices to rise. And so indeed, that is what we call a normal market. Uh, but sometimes we'll actually observe the opposite, where we will have the maturity price, I'm sorry, the maturity of the futures on the horizontal, the price on the vertical, and we'll actually observe a inverse relationship, where the futures prices decrease over time. Uh, that is called an inverted market. And because of these sort of positive uh, costs that are pushing futures prices up generally, uh, that is considered an unusual situation and uh, eventually will likely reverse, uh, but of course could be driven by some special circumstances. And finally, we could actually observe one that is sort of in between somewhere that could be for part of the period normal, and for part of it, inverted. So a hump shape, either like this, or like, like so. Now, as we sort of understand more about futures uh, and the way they're traded, let's pause to ask ourselves a couple questions. Uh, these um, are not necessarily super straightforward, but if you've been following along, you should be able to get the answers um, without my even telling. So what happens if a new trade is completed? Uh, what would the effect of a new trade uh, be in the open on the open interest of uh, a certain type of future? Well, if you think about this a little and you know that open interest is the number of currently outstanding contracts, and you know that we can make a trade either to open a contract or to close one, uh, since we now know that to close your futures position, all you need to do is just enter into an offsetting contract, 
go short if you're previously long, go long if you're previously short, um, and that would effectively cancel those contracts. Uh, what that means is that actually the effect of trading on open interest can be ambiguous. Um, it can either cause open interest to rise if new positions are established, or to fall if positions are instead closed. What about the other one? Uh, can the volume of trading in a day be greater than the open interest? Well, you might think, surely the number of trades relates to the number of open positions, so how could it be? Um, well, think about a futures market with a lot of day trading in it, where positions are opened at the beginning of the day, closed by the end of the day. Um, that's a market where actually you may have a lot of volume with all these positions being open and closed, uh, but at the end of the day find not very many positions remaining open. In other words, the open interest um, actually being lower than volume. So. The answer to that one is yes. How do we submit orders, or what types of orders can we submit in derivative markets um, as well as other markets? This is sort of a good uh, general guide for different order types. Um, we are all probably familiar with market orders, uh, the idea that we can simply submit an order for immediate execution at the best price is going to get a certainty um, in execution, but uncertainty about what that best price might be. And perhaps the second most common and well-known type of order would be the limit order, uh, the idea that we can execute a trade only at the limit price or better, um, of course with the caveat that with price certainty comes execution uncertainty. Uh, we may actually not have this order executed at all if the market price just never uh, reaches our stated limit level. Uh, the stop loss essentially executes a trade at the market price if a price falls to a certain pre-specified stop level. Um, and this is of course a risk uh, mitigation measure where if your position falls to a certain level you want to get out to minimize uh, the risk of future losses. The stop limit is a somewhat related type of order, which instead of converting uh, to a market order once your stop price is reached, as would be the case with the stop loss, uh, it converts to a limit order if that price is reached. Um, and that sort of gives you finer control over what you might uh, want to do um, in terms of capturing or avoiding future momentum uh, that you're trying to get this stop uh, conditional order um, to become active during. The market if touched, uh, you can think of it as sort of the opposite of the stop loss, essentially another trade executed at uh, market price if a price rises to a specified level. Remember the stop loss is one that essentially converts to a market order if the price falls to a certain level. Um, a market if touched uh, becomes a market order if the price rises to a certain level. A discretionary order is one that you actually submit to your broker with uh, leeway for them to choose when to submit a market order. So essentially they can delay uh, when to submit it if they have a sense of when they might be able to get a better price uh, that relative to a market order that is submitted straight away. And the last three are sort of special timing orders uh, a time of day order is one that would be executed at a specific time or range of times within a day. An open order, uh, or sometimes called a good till cancelled, is one that stays open indefinitely until it either executes or is cancelled. And a fill or kill order is one that must be executed upon receipt or discarded. Now we've talked a bit about how futures are regulated already, especially with this um, additional regulatory scrutiny that derivatives have been receiving um, since the financial crisis. Uh, we know that they are regulated by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, 
Uh, and of course, this regulation is designed to protect the public interest, especially in these sorts of disorderly liquidation cases um, involving perhaps not uh, necessarily exchange traded futures, but uh, over the counter derivatives. Uh, but as far as futures go, regulators also try to prevent questionable trading practices, for example, attempts to corner the market. Um, or other market manipulation uh, attempts by individuals, um, either exchange participants themselves or um, outside groups submitting orders to the exchange. As far as the accounting and sort of tax implications of future investments, um, here the regulators make sort of a logical distinction between hedging and speculation. So if one actually enters into a position with the express purpose of hedging and marks it as such, uh, it makes sense to recognize any profits or losses on that hedge at the same time as the asset being hedged, because these positions are intimately linked. Um, whereas if a f uh, futures or other derivative position is uh, not marked as a hedge, it's assumed to be a speculative position, and for that, profits and losses should be recognized as they are incurred, uh, simply because there's no relation to any other position that they need to wait on. Um, and this is r roughly what the tax authorities and the tax regime um, in many countries essentially tries to achieve as far as uh, the reporting and taxing of uh, either losses or profits from futures uh, positions. Now we've talked a bit about how forwards are related to futures and that they are quite similar except that forwards are traded over the counter. Uh, but again, it's an agreement to buy or sell a certain asset at a certain time for a certain price. Um, as we learned already, there's actually no daily settlement uh, but they have at least this credit support annex, uh, which would require some collateral potentially. And now with this post uh, Lehman regulatory landscape, are now more likely to be routed through centralized counterparties uh, that actually would have uh, their own margining and collateral requirements. Uh, but then in the end, uh, they work pretty similar to futures in that uh, one party buys the asset for the agreed price from the other party. The long buys from the short at the forward price, just as they would at the future price in an exchange traded uh, future contract.